in what uh, most observers can Considered to be the best non-playoff matchup of the postseason, Ohio State uh, dominates USC for the most part, 24-7 to in a pretty sloppy football game at the Cotton Bowl between these two glamorous, prestigious programs and their story traditions. We didn't necessarily get a classic in this one. We're bringing Nick Dempsey from Conquest Chronicles to help us break it down. So, Nick, I've got to give you a ton of credit here. I expected Ohio State to win. I wouldn't have been shocked if they lost, but I would have been a bit surprised. I thought they were the better team. And for, for many of the reasons that were discussed during the broadcast, just physically dominant in the trenches uh, that Sam Darnold would have to ha just go off and have a brilliant game. And that certainly didn't happen. And I thought it was going to be really close because of the strengths and weaknesses on both sides. But you, you called it as a, a relatively comfortable Ohio State win, and that's what it turned out to be. Yeah, it's uh I didn't think it would be just a such a defensive struggle, but it's it's just kind of this was just a bad game for both offenses. I I think you have to give a heck of a lot of credit to Ohio State's defensive front. Uh the USC defense played remarkably well. If you just look at the uh offensive stats for Ohio State, I think they were comfortably below their season averages in just about every single one. Um I mean, statistically, this was probably Ohio State's worst game of the season, maybe in a couple seasons. I'm not entirely sure. I'm sure there's, you know, someone who would know better. But the, you can't gift them 21 points um, off of turnovers. And you certainly can't do that if you're going to be dominated uh, on the line of scrimmage. And the US, the Ohio State defensive front, you got to give them credit. <clears throat> they killed it tonight. They absolutely uh, took everything away that they could. Uh, USC got into the uh, inside the Ohio State 40, um, which is a lot of the advanced stats use the 40 as the red zone uh, six or maybe seven times, and they walked away with seven points as opposed to uh, three times for Ohio State, and they got 17. So um, – they got the stops when they needed them. They got the sacks when they needed them. Um, they got the turnovers when they needed them. Um, Darnold has had a problem with turnovers all year. The last, basically every game since after Notre Dame, he's really cleaned it up uh, and had played well. But tonight it was just too, uh, just too many giveaways. Um, and one of them was from Burnett. Uh, but this was just, uh, you gift him 21 points and then you get, absolutely crushed on the line of scrimmage uh at that point you know stats just aren't going to matter so we'll get to the analysis on both sides I, I have people as you can imagine nick uh chiming in from time to time uh when we do these instant analysis uh segments after the games and if we go a little bit one-sided but while you're on the darnold and usc offensive uh, topic. I'm going to stay right there because right out of the gate, Ohio State took control defensively and Sam Darnold also looked awful. So I think it was a combination here. He certainly didn't play anywhere close to his potential, but it must, much of that was caused by Ohio State's pass rush and the, the dominance up front and they held out Ronald Jones. He certainly didn't get any running room. They stonewalled him most of the game. He only had 64 yards on 19 carries was the last statistic that I saw there. So I, I think a lot of things play into it. It's just not Darnold had an awful game. It wasn't just Ohio State had a brilliant defensive front seven game. I think there was a combination working, but certainly Darnold didn't have the support of Ronald Jones that he typically has. The other thing is, despite what we see, you know, when we were sitting here talking Rose Bowl and basking in the glow of the Darnold and Deontay Burnett performance at the Rose Bowl, this was almost the exact opposite situation. Darnold looked bad for most, most of the game. Deontay Burnett, despite what the statistics say, a lot of garbage catches, garbage yardage out of Deontay Burnett. He made some big mistakes early in the game that cost USC as well. Yeah, absolutely. I was shocked. Uh, well, I was not shocked that USC turned the football over. I was shocked that it was uh, Deontay Burnett. Um, that first possession was basically so painfully predictable for USC. Uh, it was like they had learned nothing uh, about how to play call or about how to you know make adjustments. It was ineffective run, ineffective run, obvious pass situation, force it to Deontay Burnett. Uh, this time it worked for about a half a second and they got 21 yards off of it. Uh, but then he fumbled and that's, 
I don't know if he is, has, has done that before, uh, turned it over, put it on the ground. He's normally very reliable. Uh, I think the next possession he had a, uh, a drop uh, or um, another mistake that kind of put them uh, in a bad spot on the second possession. But um, he, he did not have his best game, that is for sure. Um, his stats wise, he did okay. 12 for 12 receptions, 140 yards, not bad. Um, not as effective as say, uh, Tyler Vaughn's who had 120 or 119 yards on six catches, but, um, he did it. He did. He just was not up to snuff. And I, especially when you consider for several of the games in the first half of the season, he was dealing with a lot of injuries. Um, or one continuous nagging injury, uh, and he played through it and continued to contribute. Um, but I, I was not aware of any injury situation. He see, I, all for all I had heard, he was healthy. It's just he just did not uh, play particularly well. And um, even more kind of uh, impressive is that the that uh, the elite uh, cornerback for Ohio State opted at sort of the last minute not to play. I thought that was going to be a huge factor of him taking away Burnett and how USC was going to have to uh, work around that. But um, it just was not a terribly good day for him. Um, he did have, uh, I think, the most receptions in a game this season. I'm sort of looking over the stats now. Uh, and close to his most yards, but um, it just sort of, I don't know, it just, just sort of didn't click, uh, and the, the drops and the mistakes, I think it got, got in his head, but uh, stats-wise, he it looks okay, but um, the other thing I was uh, particularly impressed by with the OSU defense is, is normally if you can't get the running game going because the box is stuffed, uh, you got to throw it deep over the top and 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 burn the defense so they have to move guys back to cover the pass. And Darnold did, I think, probably this was his best game on uh, deep balls, uh, which is a little weird to say. I mean, he had some pretty clutch throws against Stanford uh, three weeks ago or a month ago, but he had some really nice-looking deep balls. Burnett had a 25-yarder catch. Vaughn's had a 37. Pittman had a 32. Um, this was – understand, this is, Darnold was a guy who was – really struggling to even get the ball kind of close to his receivers on anything longer than seven yards. And now he's hitting 25 yarders, 30 yarders, 37 yarders. And it really didn't open up the running game at all. They just, they just continued to dominate in the box. Um, so I guess, yeah, you know, Ohio state was just sort of fine with the occasional deep pass because it just wasn't enough to, to put away. Um, but th that D line kept making plays and Darnold kept making mistakes. Um, you know, you look at, at the running back stats. I mean, Jones had 64 yards running on 19 carries. Uh, and I think one of them was like a 17 yarder. Um, so that's, you know, 18 carries for like 47 yards outside of that. Uh, Steven Carr kind of nowhere to be found again, only got two touches. Um, and just sort of no one else contributed on the running games. And Darnold's 356 passing yards is just not going to be enough to overcome that. I can't remember the last time a team ran on Ohio State. They have faced uh, Jonathan Taylor, who's an 1,800-yard back from Wisconsin, who we will see tomorrow night against Miami, and he ran for all of 41 yards. And we know about Wisconsin's rushing attack, and they ran for 60 against Ohio State. 57 yards out of USC's offense uh, on the ground. Of course, the sacks, I hate the college stats because they combine the sacks into the rushing statistics, so it's not completely accurate, but uh, it comes out to 1.6 yards per carry, so they just couldn't run it. Ronald Jones, I thought, against J.K. Dobbins might be the type of uh, dual uh, running back uh, uh, showcase that we haven't seen in this postseason. I thought it was the best pair of running backs matched up in a bowl game, but they just, uh, neither one of them got loose uh, to really showcase their skills. Uh, as you credit the USC defense, I certainly believe it makes a whole lot of sense. The only caveat to that is I will say 
protecting a 24 to 7 lead at half. I don't know if Ohio State got a little vanilla. Uh, I'm guessing that we would have seen maybe a little bit more spark out of the Buckeyes offense in the second half had they been pushed to do something, but they mm -hmm. pretty much just ran, 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 punted. And uh, there was one play um, early in the fourth quarter in which uh, after USC scored the touch, or USC missed the field goal. They showed a little bit of life. They missed the field goal after Ohio State uh, gave it up on field position. Uh, they opened it up on a play action down the middle to Marcus Ball for a big gainer for Ohio State, and then they turned it over right after that. But, um, yeah, Ohio State didn't do a whole lot on offense, but uh, – they they weren't really pushed to. They only threw it 17 times on the game for 11 completions, and uh, their running backs were, <coughs> excuse me, kept in check as well. As uh, yeah, the Buckeyes win it uh, based on defensive line more than anything else in this 124 to seven against uh, uh, Tyler Vaughn's Deontay Burnett uh, receivers and running back at, uh, with Ronald Jones and with uh, the the best pro prospect in the game in. Sam Darnold. So it was defensive line versus offensive line. I would point to that first and foremost as being the decided difference between these two teams. Yeah, I, I uh, absolutely agree with you because I OSU uh, needs the running game to be effective, I think, far more than a lot of people want to admit. I know everyone going into it because it was sort of the, the exciting way to frame it because this is going to be a, this great quarterback duel between Darnold and, and, and Barrett. Um, but uh, Ohio State, um, I think, is more reliant on the rushing attack, to be honest. Uh, and that does include Barrett running. But um, the more we, outside of that for, insane fourth quarter against Penn State, for the most part, the more you had to rely on Barrett's arm, the worse Ohio State tended to do. Definitely. Um, so if you would have told me, Mark, uh, three, four hours ago, that uh, J.K. Dobbins would have 13 carries for 39 yards. Weber would have five for 18. Barrett would go 16 for 66. I would have thought, oh, man, USC is going to go nuts um, because that's just a terrible day for them. I mean, that's a pretty bad day for just about any rushing offense. But for this uh, uh, rushing offense, which is normally pretty good, um, that's an insanely <laughs> awful day. And so I thought if you would have told me that, I would have thought, well, the fourth quarter Barrett had against Penn State, he better do for four quarters or otherwise Ohio State's going to get thumped. Um, but that was not the case at all. Um, on paper, the number USC did better, but except for points uh, where – they did just as poorly uh, as as Ohio State, so this was just this is a good day uh, for defenses and fans of defenses uh, for the folks that were looking for the Rojo Dobbins uh, run fest or the uh, Barrett Darnold uh, QB duel. Um, not at all what we got, uh, quite the opposite. But um, uh, I I would have to say I don't know if you can collectively give the player of the game MVP to a uh, a front seven, but I feel like you have to give that to Ohio State's front seven. I, they they were the difference in this game. You could point to one stat; it would be turnovers, but um, overall, I think the defensive front really did some incredible things. Because again, you know, thirty nine yards out of Dobbins were that's just that's amazing to me but 19 for 64 for jones uh uh not enough to get it done nick don't ask me why i know this but uh the 2016 quick lane bowl the entire boston college defensive front was given the game mvp against maryland i know that because i do this stuff all the time and i remember yeah. stuff like that so there you go i don't know who got the game mvp but by looking at the numbers i don't think there's any question you give an ohio state defense would basically if you're looking at having to drive the football to score, pitch to shutout. They gave up a 15-yard mm -hmm. drive after the muffed punt. If mm -hmm. KJ Hill doesn't muff that punt, they may pitch a shutout in this game, 24 to nothing. Yep. Uh, the USC defense could certainly say, "Hey, we didn't give up 24 points either," and they would be right in saying that as well because the USC defense showed up as well. Uh, when you mention 
the last time Ohio State had this inept of an offensive performance, I can't say that off the top of my head. The only portion of this that doesn't make it inept is that they didn't turn the ball over. They yep. at least held on to the ball and didn't cause any negative plays in USC's direction. So they so they at least punted the ball to to move the football to the other end of the field. That's what kept it from being completely inept was they at least punted the ball. And they had the 159-yard drive. They had a long pass play to Austin Mack, and yep. then JT Barrett closed out that two-play drive with a 28-yard touchdown run. That was the one big spark of offense that they needed that I think made it 17 to nothing. And really, they weren't threatened after that. Yeah, that third touchdown, I think it was like a 60-yard drive. The one where they had, it was the turnover, uh, the 16-yard the play, uh, the face mask penalty gave him another 15, and I think Barrett took it in. Yeah, um, yeah, that's what I'm alluding to. The yeah. 28 yard uh, touchdown run. Yeah, I you know that was that was a good two plays. Um, I think that was probably the highlight of their day offensively. I don't know that they had uh, anything else that came close to that, but um, I was I I was worried about. Uh, USC has had struggled with the deep passes um, in particular. They've really started to fall apart late. Colorado had some big ones. Arizona had some big ones. USC, holy, or UCLA torched them. Um, so I was worried about Barrett uh, being able to go deep on them. Uh, and just, you know, while everyone was worried about Dobbins on the USC defense, Barrett would be able to throw it deep and, and torch them. But... No, did not happen. Um, I mean, they got a couple of big ones, like you said, the Mac one, and I think Ball had the twenty yarder. Uh, but it, uh, I mean, eleven receptions in total, or eleven completions, um, just kind of crazy. That, but I think you're right. I think this is as close as you can get to a perfect game for the OSU defense. And as I'm starting to think about it. Uh, I would be very interested in this, interested to see where this Ohio State defense ranks historically, particularly the run defense. Uh, when you think about how they just absolutely destroyed Saquon Barkley um, and Wisconsin's running game and Ronald Jones completely taken out, uh, you think about all the great running backs – uh, they've run up against this season, and I'm sure there's others that I can't think of uh, off the top of my head, but um, they did some really impressive things, and I, I would be very interested to see historically uh, how they how they stack up. Nick, what I would like to hear from you that I would find interesting is how good these teams are, so I'll give you my quick synopsis. I would agree with most people, and I typically don't, but I'm usually the contrarian, but I will basically agree with the nation that until I see something different in the playoff games that Oklahoma, Georgia, and Clemson in some order, and I believe Clemson at this point to be the best team, but those three teams are the best teams in the country, and that Ohio State, and even though I thought USC had a legitimate claim to the playoff, that they had a legitimate argument based on strength of schedule and winning a conference championship, I didn't think that they were in the Ohio State-Alabama league. I thought the argument, if you're going by best team, uh, was between Alabama and Ohio State. And and again, I'm not going to go through this because people are sick of me ranting about this, but I would have put Ohio State in the playoff because they won a conference championship. And now, with this win, they've beaten Wisconsin, Penn State, uh, Michigan State, and USC. They've beaten three teams in the top 10 and four teams in the top 15, and Alabama has nothing close to that resume. <coughs> Excuse me. And then after seeing this performance against an elite offense, uh, I'm going to be interested to see what Alabama does against Clemson. Uh, I do think that uh, Ohio State is certainly one of the top five teams in the country, and they're probably right in that range where USC, I think it gets very muddled after that. Uh, there are just so many good teams across the country, but flawed teams like a USC, like Michigan State, like uh, TCU, uh, a number of teams that we've seen in recent days and we'll see over the next couple of days, Miami tomorrow night, Wisconsin. They're very good teams, but they're not elite like maybe the Ohio State team we saw tonight. And, and I, I don't even want to go with the term elite. I think that's a bit of a stretch too. Very, very good team. But uh, USC's in that 
in that what eight to fifteen range nationally? Yeah, I would say so. I think USC's biggest problem uh, was um, they didn't get Washington on their schedule. Um, the only ranked team they beat was Stanford. Uh, they beat them twice to their credit. Uh, the other two ranked teams they played, Washington State, they lost, and then Notre Dame, which they just got trounced by. And then Notre Dame lost to a bunch of other people in pretty uh, rough fashion. Um, so, I, you know, I, USC, I think, had the weakest argument. Um, but it... it it's tough for me to say it, it's tough for me to say resume wise that that Alabama doesn't get in and OSU should get in because of resume but then we just so very quickly say but Clemson and Georgia absolutely should be in because they played a conference championship game a 13th data point which is great but you know Georgia got a second chance to beat Auburn is I'm can we definitively say that their resume is better than Alabama's? Uh, and, you know, Clemson, the ACC was not nearly as good this year. And certainly the SEC East was, I mean, how many coaches got fired in that division? <laughs> um, so in a lot of respects, it's, it's hard for me to say definitively, which everyone does, that it's Clemson, Georgia, Oklahoma, definitely in. But Alabama not. And always you should be in because the resume is better than Alabama. Well, okay, but if you're going by resume, I, I, I think there's some some flaws in the three teams who are certain are definitely qualified to be there uh, when you compare them. Like basically, what you're saying is uh, Georgia is definitely in because they weren't in the same division as Auburn. Uh, in the same conference. No, in the same division, they weren't. Thus, they could afford to lose to Auburn and get in and then get another crack at them. Um, you know, and who was, you know, the, the ACC was certainly not nearly as good. Um, and, you know, can we say Clemson sort of getting through that slate is definitively better than Alabama's resume? Um, you know, I, yes, Ohio State had a tougher path. But, you know, who did Alabama lose by 24 to? Um, so I, I think it's fine uh, the way they picked them. I don't think the outrage from a lot of OSU fans should uh, was justified, to be honest with you, um, especially since they got the same benefit that Alabama got this year. They got last year. Um, and then, yeah, that's not know, my argument. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying like the outrage seemed uh, over the top to me. Because um, I said Penn State should have made it last year. Well, and that's fair. Uh, the, you're at least consistent there. The folks that it's it's the folks that said, "Oh, Ohio <laughs> State definitely deserved it sure. last year." Well, they're fans. Well, yeah, but, they're all fans, but they are right. fans, uh, and they're arguing like fans. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I would put more weight into conference championship games. I think if there was. Uh, a little more, I don't know about, I guess, reasonableness to it uh, because I think so much determines on which conference you're in or wh how the divisions are sort of balanced out um, because I, I don't know that we can definitively say Wisconsin's the second best team in the conference. Um, are, can we definitively say they're better than Michigan State or Penn State? We don't know. So... Would they have had one good game, beat Ohio State? Would they be conference champions? Yes. <laughs> but would they be the best team or the most qualified or the most deserving? I don't know because they beat a lot of 500 teams and not particularly you know, exciting looking. And Nick, if anything, there have been other years in the Big Ten. I'll speak to two years ago when Iowa almost made the playoff when they took Michigan State to the one-yard line, got knocked mm -hmm. out, and then they got railroaded in the uh, Rose Bowl by Christian McCaffrey when yeah. they were undefeated, they barely lost to Michigan State, and there was a row of teams in the Eastern Division, i.e. Michigan State, Ohio State, and Michigan, that were far superior to Iowa. Yeah. 
and, and they, uh, just, they, they just sort of missed it. it. Yeah, and th that that division of the Big Ten, I think every year it's like who <laughs> lucks out by dodging the most of the four teams in the West that we're concerned about: Michigan, Michigan State, Penn State, Ohio State. Uh, Wisconsin, objectively a good team, and they missed three of those four uh, in the regular season anyway. But I don't. If they played in the in the other division with Ohio State and those teams. I don't know if they're even in the top three. I can't say that for sure. So would it have been fair then? They had one tough opponent, two, I guess, if you count Michigan, all season long. Two opponents in the top 40. They happen to have good days and win those. And what if Wisconsin would have won but uh, with Barrett throwing just a few too many interceptions and they would have made the comeback? Uh, you know, then it looks kind of really bad. Like, they didn't really beat OSU. OSU kind of blew it. So... I get what you're saying about conference championships. I get the whole 13th data point argument, but I also think the way they're set up, like conference championships are set up for a regional champion. It's set up for regionality. It is not set up for a national sport and a national champion. And I think that's the problem. Uh, but, you know, I think it's just, it's hard to lose by four or five scores to a seven and five Iowa team or whatever they went. And then also kind of gets smoked pretty hard by uh, Oklahoma. Who's also in the playoffs and say definitively that, that you should be in. Uh, well, I don't think it's definitive. I just think that I would have selected Ohio state because they won a conference championship. Plus they had a better resume than Alabama. And again, I believe in the conference is meaning something. So what we're telling the, public is that we're selecting two from the sec meaning they get two representatives and this is one of the reasons why this year is different from last year i everybody keeps comparing ohio state or alabama situation this year to ohio state situation last year and there are about 18 different reasons why i could make the distinction but the one i'll make right here is that the big 10 received representation last year even if you <coughs> excuse me disagreed that it should have been penn state over ohio state at least it was the big 10 getting represented unlike this year where now we're in the fourth year of the playoff and you have the sec now with five representatives in four years how many out of the pac-12 two in four mm -hmm. years they've had two representatives and the sec's had five and the big 12's had two this is becoming very, very unbalanced in terms of representation in the playoff. Well, that I, I will give you. It has been unbalanced, and it is. I mean, uh, let's be fair here. the The center of the college football world is definitely in the, um, well, let's call it the old confederacy between the ACC and the SEC. That's just sort of where most of the attention is paid. Um, and as you know, a Pac-12 guy, you welcome, well, welcome to our party. Welcome to our club of, of disrespect. We don't have jackets or anything, but I feel like we should. Um, but I, I can't just inherently say that it's, it's not good because the representation is unbalanced. Um, maybe it just works out that way, uh, that the SEC, those five teams that have represented them, uh, uh were the most deserving or the most qualified but um i also don't like the idea of like well we have to keep it balanced we have to get someone from the midwest in there otherwise the it's it it doesn't work um so yeah it's very sec centric sec acc they're they're, they're going to get sort of the benefit of the doubt um but at the end of the day I, you know i just I can't be terribly outraged by how this went down.